Hi everybody, I'm Fred Cook, President of Schaefer Marine. And today we're in Alameda, California, and we're gonna be putting a jib furling system on 134 that was built in 1983. Now this boat belongs to some good friends of mine, Bob and his wife Pam Carlin. And for years they raced this boat in the Bay Area successfully. But now they want to get a jib furling system on there so that they don't have the requirement for as many crew to go sailing and just make the boat overall a lot easier to sail on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're going to be converting from a racing foil to the jib furler. Today we're going to be installing a 2100 furler on this boat. Now we're going to walk you through the assembly of this, explaining the names of the components and the assembly procedure. Now, everything to do with the 2100 furler is very similar to the 1100 furler instructions and the 3100 furler instructions. So, I think if you learn this one and see all the examples of how we're putting it together, it will apply to the other systems that we manufacture and sell. So, the Schaefer furler is shipped to you in a box and a tube. The tube contains all the extrusions for the system, and we'll explain that in a little bit. And then the box has all the components, including the drum, the swivel, and all the small parts that go into the assembly of the system. So we'll show you that next. So we've unpackaged the box, and we have all the elements laid out on a shipping blanket on the dock, and we'll go through it one by one. One of the most important items in the box is a set of instructions on assembling the furlers. We really recommend that you take a few minutes, sit down, read through it, and then read through it again. It'll establish what the names of the parts are and the order and the procedure for assembling the furler. As you can see, this is the same instructions for the 1100, 2100, and 3100 systems. They all are very similar and require the same assembly procedure. The largest component in the box is the torque tube and drum assembly. Now we will be taking this apart and reassembling it when we put it on the head stay. So get familiar with all the components and the fasteners that are in the drum and top plates. The next important component in the box is the upper swivel. Now you'll note the way it's displayed on the blanket here that the furler has the large portion up and there is even a small logo on here that's marked with the arrow and an up designation. So please get familiar with that because a number of people have installed them upside down which is not as efficient as the correct way which is the way it is displayed on the blanket here. The next item is the stainless steel feeder. Now this is an investment cast stainless steel piece. It's two pieces that are screwed together with Allen head fasteners. Get familiar with how to disassemble that part as it clamps over the foils. Also included will be a toggle. Now the lower toggle forms the foundation for the furling system and that is ordered by the pin size of your head stay. And if you look at our ordering instructions, you'll measure the pin and we'll provide you with the right toggle assembly to fit both your turnbuckle and the stem head. Also included is a stainless steel flared fitting that's going to be attached to the mast up at the masthead. Now this fitting is designed to create an angle between the halyard and the forestay, which prevents halyard wrap on the upper swivel. There are several plastic bags in the kit. The contents of one involves having the extrusion joints. Now these are the connectors that hold the full length foils together and they're riveted to the foils. There's one special joint not riveted in. It has a welded tip on one end of it. Now hold that one aside and that is the upper joint that's going to be used after you cut the extrusions to length on the system. In another plastic bag in the kit are a series of nylatron bearings. Now this is a two-piece nylatron bearing that's going to be installed over the wire and inserted into the C-shaped extrusions and then put inside of the furling extrusions themselves. The purpose of the nylotron bearing is to isolate the aluminum components from the stainless steel wire or rod that forms the head stay. One of the smaller parts in the kit is the top cap that gets uh, set with two Allen screws and finishes the extrusion at the top to prevent chafe on the halyards. 
So finally, there are a number of small components. There are three shackles which go on the tack of the drum. Two of them go on the halyard swivel at the top, uh, one to attach the halyard and the other to attach the sail to the swivel at the top. There are two bags of fasteners. One is all the rivets that are required to put the joints together. And the other one is a small bag that contains a lot of spare fasteners and a few spare rivets in case there's a problem. Or like me, you tend to drop parts in the water. And finally, there are three Allen wrenches in a small bag. Those are the three Allen wrenches that are required to assemble all the Allen head fasteners on the system. And then there is a long handle Allen wrench, which is used to adjust and clamp fasteners in the stainless steel cage at the bottom on the drum. In addition to the tools and the parts in the standard kit, you'll need to collect the following tools. A battery-powered electric drill, drill bits, and taps for 1032 or 1024 fasteners. This is used for the pullback device at the masthead. A hacksaw will be used to cut the extrusion to the correct length at the top and then be covered by the top cap. The pop rivet gun is used to assemble all the pop rivets in the extrusions and joints. Next you'll need some needle nose, standard pliers, and dike pliers in order to take the old head stay off and make the conversion to the new head stay, bending cotter pins, and removing pins as you go. The two Phillips head screwdrivers are required to take all the fasteners out of the plates of the drum and to separate the torque tube from the bearing pack at the bottom. Also handy is a 100 foot cloth tape which is used to measure the length of the head stay and make the head stay adjustments. We suggest you get a bucket to put small parts in and tie that off to the boat or tie it off to the dock so that you don't risk parts going into the drink. Finally you need a roll of rigging tape or electrical tape to cover up bent cotter pins and to mark the extrusions so that you can find the correct cut length. Inside the shipping tube are the longer joints and extrusions that are required to assemble the system. The shorter extrusion is the half extrusion, which is used to stagger the joints at the top that allow the installation of a longer bearing. There are a number of full length extrusions that are six feet long and then the darker extrusion to the right is the bottom reinforcing extrusion joint and that's used to span between the torque tube and above the feeder into the first extrusion. The bottom short piece here is the bottom extrusion that is the outer extrusion used between the torque tube and the feeder. Before we go down on the docks and start the assembly and then place it on the boat, I thought it would be helpful to review a few things that are needed to do in order to get you the correct parts. We need to know the overall length of the head stay, we need to know the diameter of the wire, and we need to know the diameter of the pins. Why that's important is we want to make sure you get the parts that you need to make this a smooth installation. Every one of our systems comes with a new heavy-duty toggle and link. And the reason for that is that the, we needed a place to pin the entire furling system on here and then the old head stay attaches to the top of that. Now that's a heavy duty toggle, because, much heavier than normal, because we have a lot of side loads that are being induced when you're using the furling line, which weren't part of the original head stay. So this allows the additional articulation, it's overbuilt for a reason, to make the system more reliable. Now if you're using the existing head stay, you can make the conversion. We make sure that you get a new stay lock fitting, which allows you to shorten the head stay to compensate for the toggle that we just introduced at the bottom. And we'll, as we lay it out on the dock, you'll see all these pieces. And I think you'll see that this is a very easy installation. I think you'll be able to do it. One of the first things we had to do was inspect the head stay of the Hunter 34. We needed to know the wire diameter and the pin sizes. Now in this case it was all half inch pins. There was a marine eye up at the top with a half inch pin to a toggle in the masthead. And there was this toggle at the bottom on the stem head fitting. Now this has been on the boat since 1983 and it's had some pretty aggressive use being raced here in the Bay Area. So just out of an abundance of caution, although it, it looks to be in fairly good shape, and there are no cracks in the swedge studs. And the fact that it's been covered up, we really can't see what the wire looks like. We've decided to replace the head stay. Now, 
that helps because what we would have to do if we were going to put the Schaefer furler on this head stay, you can do it, but what we'll have to do is that we're going to be adding this toggle, which is the Schaefer base toggle, in line with the rest of the head stay. And if we did that, then we would have to shorten the head stay by a corresponding amount. And that's what you would do in that case is you would cut the old swedge stud off the top and put a stay lock fitting in and reduce the overall length by four inches to a com four and a half inches in the case of a 2100 to accommodate the 2100 toggle at the bottom additional length. Now, in our case, we're going to be disposing of all this. So we had one made by our friends at Butler Rigging up at Alameda and uh, they measured up the old one and we told them what we'd be doing with the boat and that we'd be adding a Schaefer toggle. We ended up by making the head stay cut length the corresponding amount to shorten for the Schaefer toggle. In other words, they cut it to length for us so we didn't have to do it here in the field. And a lot of boats are getting to the point where you really should take a hard look. Boats in the 80s, it's just um, from our experience, 33, 34 years is enough uh, to indicate that we probably ought to move on to a new head stay. By having the rigging shop shorten the head stay by the amount of our toggle, we now get back to our original pin to pin dimension and the turnbuckle adjustment will be in the same location. So now in the case of the old head stay, if we had converted it and we're using a stay lock fitting, we would assemble the components of the furler from the top down. As we have a new pre-cut and shortened head stay, we're going to be assembling the parts over this threaded marine stud and go from the bottom up. So they're both, they're both explained in the assembly instructions. So if you get a new head stay, it's a bottom up extrusion assembly process. If you cut the old wire, it's a top down assembly instruction. So on page 31 of our instructions, we have a diagram and we have a series of calculated figures that go in here. And what we're using this for is to determine what the length of the top extrusion needs to be. Now the top extrusion is the one we cut. And in this case, we're going to be installing from the bottom up. So we need to know what that top extrusion is going to be cut to so it can be assembled first. So we've just measured this stay length, which we call SL on our diagram, with a closed turnbuckle to this dimension, which is 47 feet, three and a half inches. So we've taken the system length, we have an SL of 47 feet, three and one half inches. And then we're deducting out um, on the 2100 in this table, it says that the TT dimension, which is listed here, which is to the feeder, the TT dimension is three feet 10. And what we're doing here is we also have a top cap deduction, which is the finishing top cap at the top of the system, which is an inch and a quarter. And if we do some quick math on that, what we find is the total length, or TL, of the foils, excuse me, 43 feet, four and a quarter. Now we're gonna use, or seven full foils at six feet, that gets it to 42 feet. And then the remaining length is one, turns out to be one foot, four and a quarter. Now that's less than the 18 inches that we'd like to see at the top. So what we're gonna do is insert a half foil in here and then cut the longer foil down to four feet, four and a quarter to make sure that the joints are staggered below the swivel. So that explains this little block at the bottom, it explains why we're substituting a half foil for a full foil at the very top so that we don't have a joint working too close to the swivel assembly itself. But this is a very helpful measurement system. We can cut the foil and then slide it up to the top, really save ourselves some time in the assembly of this process. So just as a cautionary to check your math, it's never a bad idea to just lay the components out alongside the wire and the tape measure and confirm your top dimensions before you cut the extrusion. Using the calculation sheet, we came up with an estimated dimension using a half foil as the next from the top of four feet, four and a quarter inches. And adding back in the top cap for another inch and a half, we're exactly there. We're at four feet six on our overall 
dimension to the bottom of the swedge stud. Now just as an example of what happens here, we like to have a longer foil at the top rather than a shorter foil at the top because there are side loads being induced by the swivel and we'd prefer not to have the swivel riding right on top of a joint. So an example of that, if we were to shift these two out and had a longer length coming up and then did our cut length here, we would have a, a length that was only about 16 inches long. And the swivel's likely to be riding somewhere in this area depending on how the sails cut. And that's going to be a problem. We really like to not have the, the swivel working on a joint mechanism if we can avoid it. So the longer length is better at the top. So we substitute these two. We put the shorter length a little lower and we get a longer upper foil that way by four and a half, four, almost four and a half feet. And so now we're going to measure that one to four feet, four inches and do the cut. So now that we have the top extrusion cut, it's simply a matter of assembling the foils onto the head stay and joining them with the riveted joint. So first thing we do is we take the turnbuckle body apart. So we're going to start with the top cap. You can't forget to put the top cap on the wire. And then we're going to put the first extrusion up there. And then we have a long push here up the wire. All the way to the top. And now we have the half length foil which we're going to put on next. And the same thing, get the first few foils on and then we'll go up and put the C-shaped joint extrusion on as we progress down the, the foil. We'll get two or three of the foils on and then we can show you how they all rivet together. Here's a little tip. We're working on a concrete dock. It's pretty rough. So you can use the tubes that came in the shipping container and just turn them into V's like that, break them open and insert them under the foils. And it just gives you something to keep everything elevated off the uh, concrete. So now that the foils are all laid out and on the wire, we're going to start assembling the foils together with the joints. Now at the top we have a special joint. It's actually just a bearing holder. It doesn't have any drilled holes for rivets, but it has two little welded nubs here on these slots. Now those are there to keep the foil, this joint, from sliding down in. We're going to put the nylotron bearing over the wire, put the C-shaped extrusion on, line it up with the foil, and insert it, and push it all the way down in. And then the top cap goes over that, and we use the Allen screws in either side, put one of them into a groove, set it, and then do the other side against the foil. And that finishes the top of the foil. Now we move down to the joint down here, which is the next one down, and that will have rivets, and we'll show you that next. From here on down, all the joints are the same. They're all pre-drilled for the rivets. There's even a little space in here so that the rivet can expand and lock. Uh, you're going to use another set of nylotron bearings. These are all the same. And we're going to go over the wire again and then insert this into the two to extrusion. So we're going over the wire, line everything up, and then insert it into one of the extrusions. In this case it's the bottom extrusion. I'm going to put one rivet in just to hold things in, in place while I push it into the upper extrusion and get all the holes lined up. And then what's good here is you just you take one pop rivet and one extrusion, force it in there, walk it in, and then do one in the upper extrusion, and then fit all the other rivets in. So that's one joint. We have a nice secure stiff joint with a good bearing in it, and now we're going to repeat the process 
at every connection all the way down on every foil until we get to the torque tube. So here we are at the bottom of the extrusions. They've all been riveted and put together. And we're about to put the long torque tube joint in and the bottom torque extrusion leading up to where this feeder is going to live. But before we did that, we put the swivel on. And remember which way this goes, it's the large part up on the foil. And uh, so we slid that to get it in and out of the way. We used one of the boxes from the shipping container to protect it from the concrete. And now everything's laid out and ready to go. We're going to finish this off, take the drum apart, start assembling everything in order to lift it up into the air. Going on. This is a, just a longer extrusion. It has two rivets in it, as does the one above it. That's a standard foil, and this is the bottom short piece that comes out and goes up to where the feeder is going to be. And if you notice how it's been drilled, there's a gap here, and that's so that the feeder, which is right here, take this apart and it'll go over that gap. So we'll do that in a minute, but we're going to need to run the torque tube up. So we're not going to put the feeder on until we get done with uh, the assembly of the torque tube and the drum. So step one is to take the stainless steel cages off. And that's why we give you the long Allen, long wrenched Allen. And these have captive fasteners so they won't drop in the water. There's one on either side. These are mirror images of each other. So we're going to set those aside for now. And then we're going to take the plates off the drum face. That takes a little Phillips screwdriver, which we have here. Now these are not captive, so you have to be a little careful with these fasteners. And then these pull apart like this. Now when we're down to this, get this pulled off. Now we have these fasteners that are at the top between this tube, the, the bearing tube, and the torque tube and on this nice tapered piece of aluminum. We're going to take these fasteners out. Now there are also some fasteners here, but they are special non-tamper button heads. And the reason for that is that's how the bearings are loaded and we don't want you going in there. So we've put a different fastener on those. There's no reason to open that up. That was all pre-packaged at the factory. You want to take these apart and when you do, this will give you full access to where the turnbuckle is going to live. We're going to just take these two apart now that the fasteners are out of them. This is the bearing pack with Torlon bearings. I'm going to set that aside right now. And this is the torque tube assembly. And there's a little bit of disassembly to go here. We take the hammer pin or the set pin out of the front face of the torque tube. And this is, has a stop pin machined into it. And that keeps the extrusions from hammering down and getting on top of the swedge stud. So that's a limiting pin that should be in there. Um, so we're going to set that aside as well because we want to slide it up the extrusions. Loosen this top cap up, get it out of the way so we can reassemble our turnbuckle. And we'll just take it off. So this slides up, slides all the way up, gets up out of the way. It can even go above where the feeder is going to be located. We're going to bring it back down later. All right, so now we're, we're reinstalling the turnbuckle. And we'd left some reference marks on there. We're not going to go all the way to that because we know that's where the head stay is going to be tightened to, but we have to get it on first. So we need a little bit of slack. We're going to leave it, leave it right about there. So now we're going to pull one of the pins in the cross pin. Now this is the entire foundation of the furling system. So we're going to pull that pin out and it's going to get reinserted through the hole that's in the toggle right here. So now we have the bottom bearing pack and we're going to assemble that. <coughs> um, bring that on here. The pin that we just pulled out of it is going to go through the toggle and that creates the mounting point for the furler. Get that lined up. Now. These pins that are going in here live behind the, um, the hollow inside of the stainless steel cage that goes on the outside of this. So we don't have the need to do anything but bend them a little bit 
to keep them from falling out until we get the cage back on the system. So you just bend them about like that and that'll keep them in place and then the cage can go around it. And I'll show you an example of that. We have this little void in here where this pin and its cotter pin are going to live as soon as we put it all back together. And put this together. Put the four fasteners back in it. We will be opening this up again because we have to put cotter pins in after it's installed and we've adjusted the turnbuckle. Now, line that up, push this up, and then we reassemble. So we have the end of the extrusion here, the bottom end of the extrusion. is going to go up against the hammer pin. So we're going to move the hammer pin in, and then we engage that. The extrusion should rest on it. And now is we're going to put the top clamp on. Now that has two grooves in it, which go into the two grooves that are in the foil extrusion. And then we're going to tighten that up. And now the foils in the torque tube are joined. And that's all we have to do to that right now. We will be moving that up again after we get it in place so that we can adjust the turnbuckle. So we just get these firm but not tight. And we'll be taking the hammer pin out and we'll be loosening these up to slide up the torque tube again when we do the final adjustment of the turnbuckle. Now remember, and this is something never to forget, is your turnbuckle's in there and it's ready to go back on the boat, but it does not have its cotter pins in it yet. And we don't want to leave it for the night or anything else without having taken this apart one more time to adjust the turnbuckle and make sure it has the cotter pins in it to lock the turnbuckle in place so it won't unthread from the vibration or the cyclical, the cyclical motions that a, a harmonic wind might create. Um, so that would unloosen the, the turnbuckle and we might lose the mast. So it's critical to remember you're not done here. <clears throat> There's one more thing to do after we get it pinned to the masthead and the stem head of the boat. And that's to take it apart, tighten up the turnbuckle, and put the cotter pins in. Other than that, we have the feeder, and that's a two-piece assembly. And we can put that on right now because we are only going to have to get the torque tube up enough that um, we can adjust the turnbuckle. And essentially, the system's ready to put on the boat. Um, we're going to put the top and bottom plates on the drum after it's on board. We'll put the cage, stainless steel cage, will go back on afterwards. It's just better. We don't have risk scratching them up while we're putting it up on the boat. It's a little easier to get up to the stem head and do it when it's this big and not doesn't have the entire assembly of the drum on it. So at this point, we just kind of clean up, organize. And we have a friend coming down who's going to go up the mast and get that connected to the masthead. So now with the system hooked up to the forestay, we need to adjust the turnbuckle back to its original marks so we get the original head stay length. And we left some marks on there with a marking pin. And we just have to tighten up the turnbuckle. Then we put the torque tube back onto the uh, bearing pack and put the set pin back in at the top. And we should be good to go. Now we have to always remember to put the cotter pins on this turnbuckle once we have it adjusted up about a quarter of an inch, there you go. Now with the furler attached, the turnbuckle fully adjusted, all the cotter pins set, we can reassemble the furler drum. So we're going to do the two bottom plates here. 
and the smaller the two fasteners. So now we'll do the top plates, same way. Get those. The screws back into that. Okay, now we have the two parts of the cage, which we're going to fit on here over the pins. Okay, and that'll do for now until we figure out where the lead for the uh, control line is going to be. So now that the furler is installed on the boat and all the pins have been secured, we're ready to do the final elements of the installation. One thing that we need to coordinate with the sail maker on is the length of the luff. Now remember that these sails on this boat, this boat was raced, and they have full hoist sails. And they were tacked to the deck down at the snap shackle fitting, and they were full hoist sails all the way up the luff. In the case of the jib furler, the tack point is now moved to the top of the drum, and then we also have to accommodate for the space that's taken up by the upper swivel. So we're going to measure that head stay, and then we're going to take the sail over to the sail loft and have a talk with the sail maker about what alterations are necessary in order to convert this from a 90% blade to a cruising sail for this boat. Well, we're here at uh, Pineapple Sails with Cami Richards, and we've brought over the jib that um, our owners would like to use on the boat. And we'd like to get Cami to review what it is that needs to be done to a sail in order to get it to work on the boat as a cruising jib. And I guess the best way to do it is just Straight dump up. it out and let's you, take a look exactly at it. Right. Okay. Cover it. Okay. So basically, uh, the, one of the limiting factors is how tall is the sail. Okay. Well, so we, me we measured the um, free luff availability with the swivel up and down to the attachment point on the drum, and it came out to 44 feet, 2 inches. Two. So basically, that's the number the sailmaker wants is the total length available. Right. And then the sailmaker will shorten that by maybe six inches or so. Yeah, to get some so stretch. So you've got halyard room to play around with yeah. up there. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> so on this sail here, we're looking at 42, you know, 42.3 feet. Okay. So the sail is, is not too tall, so that makes it easy. Okay, maybe even a, require yep. a small pennant at the top. That's correct. And then yeah. that would keep the swivel as high so, up as it should be exactly to, get, right. to work with the, the, um, swivel, the pullback device. The swivel needs to be in very close proximity to the halyard exit. Right. Otherwise, you, that's how you get halyard wraps up right. on the top. And we've put a pullback so, device on the mast oh, good. Up above the black good, band. Good. Okay. We can't decide whether that's a restrainer or a retainer. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Must be a restrainer. So, uh, first step, is the sail too tall? No, it's not. This is just fine. Okay. Uh, if it's an old racing sail, it will often be too tall because the furling swivel at the top and the drum at the bottom shortens the available force Correct. daily. Correct. So you, you, we need to know that. That was one of my concerns because you know, a lot of times they'll be full hoist. Right. And But a small blade jib yes. like this is. Yeah, okay. so this is going to be fine. Um, then I think maybe the next biggest deal after that is structurally is the sail okay. All right. Right, and so by basically looking at this sail, one of the things that we can see if we put on our detective hat, is that basically this sail has been cut down from something that was bigger yeah, they to, to a yeah. smaller sail. They mentioned right. it was like a 125 or 130. Okay, and this At is one looking time like, was a, cut down. like a 90 or something like that? Yeah, it's a 90 okay. now. Okay, there's, there's nothing really wrong with that. I mean, in this case, it's going to work just fine. And, I mean, if you get back to the corner and stuff, just all you want to see is that it's not that the cloth is not too beat up. Yeah. And here's the old stitching from the straps where the clue ring used to be down in here. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. Um, but and the other thing is, is just what's a cloth sound like? Right. I don't. I mean, this stuff. This is pretty firm. This is going right. to be just fine. If it's uh, swishy like a bed sheet, won't be just fine. Yeah, it'd be too be soft. Fine. Too soft. Okay. Um, so. Uh, the conversion of this jib is pretty straightforward, I think. Okay. Um, the things that uh, the other things that we need to know are um, 
when you roll up, which way does the jib roll up on the forestay? Okay. And when you roll it up, one side is going to be out, and we want to have the cover on that outside. Okay. I think, <clears throat> I think what we'll have is this um, starboard side of the sail will have the we'll cover. We've routed the lines down the starboard side, and we're going to cross into the, the, the bow. Perfect. Right. That's great. Uh, and then the only other thing we need is a color. Did you talk to them about that? Yeah, they, right now the boat's got blue covers, but what they want to do is convert over to a medium gray. Okay. I think the, okay. the, the designation was yeah. cadet, cadet gray. gray. So our owners uh, used to race this boat quite a bit, and they had a um, tough luff, I think a 1205, which right. is a number five luff tape. Are we going to be able to use the number five tape in the Schaefer furler that requires a six? Absolutely. Have you, but it's it gonna, should work it'll fine, It'll be right? just fine. Okay. It's not going to come out, right? I mean, if, if we were going to put on a new one, we'd certainly put on a six, but it's not worth taking right. off a five. To right. On That's six. what I was wondered what your experience yeah. had been with yeah. that. No, it'll be good. So I think having a jib furler on there is great. It's going to be wonderful. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Good. Our final step is to install the control blocks and lead line to control the furler. To accomplish this, we manufacture a number of unique fittings. The first being a spring-loaded block that can be mounted to a stanchion or to the deck. And this provides a 90-degree lead to the center of the drum so that you get a smooth roll. We also manufacture some blocks that can be mounted over the stanchion and allow the control line to run on the outside of the stanchion, thus reducing clutter on deck. The final block is a ratchet block, which provides very little friction when you're pulling the system in but provides a certain amount of tension when the sail is being unrolled to make sure that the control line is in a tight pack on the drum of the furler. Now a critical element in laying out the lead lines and controls is that the line come off the drum at a 90 degree angle from the center of the drum. Now if it goes too high, like I'm showing here, when the furler rolls up, a lot of the line will get bundled on the top of the spool and won't be evenly distributed. Correspondingly, if we go too low, then we're going to have all the rope collect on the bottom. And this can cause some jamming. If we have it right in the middle at a 90 degree pull from the center, it tends to spool up very evenly and you won't have any problems with jamming of the line. So normally there's a stanchion that we can attach a stanchion lead block, the spring-loaded block. Uh, we can clamp it on to that stanchion. But in this case, we don't have a stanchion that's near to the right height or the right angle. So we're going to mount it on deck. So we're going to create a 90 degree angle to this and we're going to bring the block down and mount it on deck so that we get it in the correct location. So we've taken the back or the clamping part of that block apart and we're going to drill and tap to the aluminum rail and this will provide us with a nice fair lead to make sure that the furler rolls smoothly. To install the stanchion lead blocks, we've removed the lifelines from the stanchions and then the block fits over the top and is tied to the bottom. Now there's a small hole in the shiv right here in the center of the shiv and with an allen key you can insert it in the center of the block and there's a set pin right here which gets tightened against the stanchion and that holds the stanchion the block in place on the stanchion. And then we're going to repeat that process on the other two stanchions behind us. This is a very easy installation. I think you'll be able to do it. Uh, if not, don't hesitate in order to get some help from a professional rigger. Most of the riggers in this country have done Schaefer furlers. They're very competent in doing this. Um, we'd encourage you to work with them because they're, they're a wealth of resources in trying to make sure that your installation is properly done and safe. If you have any other questions, please feel free to contact our customer service department. We're all here to help.